Well, this was a fun one because when I got to interview Scott Morgan, who is co-owner and president of Lincoln Tool and Design, I felt like I was interviewing Alex P. Keaton, you know, that great Michael J. Fox character from Family Ties from that 80s sitcom. Why do I say that? Well, Scott Morgan was reading the Wall Street Journal as a kid, as a kid growing up in Sutton, Nebraska. He got so many great lessons growing up in his little Mayberry in Sutton, Nebraska, and that has helped turn him into a very successful, what he calls himself, serial entrepreneur. So many great lessons from this episode with Scott Morgan. Please enjoy it. Well, this is great. I feel like I get a chance to sit across from the Alex P. Keaton uh, of of the manufacturing industry, you know, from Family Ties, the Michael J. Fox character, because it's not often that I get to interview someone who spends more time reading the Wall Street Journal growing up than, than the comic section. Yep. So we're going to start there. Tell me a little bit about getting started with the Wall Street Journal as a kid, because again, such a unique story. Sure. So I grew up, I was a voracious reader. I read books. Um, anytime I could get out of class, I would go to the library and our library had the Lincoln Journal Star, the Omaha World Herald, and the Wall Street Journal. And I would read the Omaha World Herald, I'd read the Journal Star, and so the Wall Street Journal was was a, a newspaper that I could fill my brain with more useless information is kind of how I call it. <laughs> but I, that's what I spent my time with. And, and any time I could get out of class, so that meant sometimes, you know, in math class, I remember doing every problem on the homework assignment while the teacher was instructing. So by the time he was done teaching, I was already done with the homework so I could go to the library. And if I didn't go to the library, I was probably going to be a bit of a pain in the butt to that teacher. Yeah. So I went to the library about eight times a day. Wow. I read. read you were a voracious reader. Yeah. 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 And, you know, I, I think there's something so interesting there. A buddy of mine, uh, Danny Crittenrink, who has gone on to become the uh, ambassador to Vietnam, works in the State Department, graduated with me in 86. That was something he did as well. In the summertime, sat behind underneath this big old tree out on a farmstead and read and read and read. It's a bit of a lost art though today. And what would you say to business owners out there who aren't reading as much? I got to imagine, because today you still continue to read. I, I read two books in the last two weeks. There's times that I pause, I don't find the time, but then there's times where I get a recommendation or a referral and I take that as a challenge to go read the book. Um, I, I struggle with podcasts. I, I listen to, to talk radio. Or you won't now. You'll be all over it after today. <laughs> I listen to a few podcasts. When, when there's a recommendation, I'll listen to it. But uh, talk radio, and I mean, I need to fill my brain with news and what's going on in the community, and Huskers are always on. You know, there's somebody talking about them. Um, so I read books. They're portable. They're, they're flexible. And I know you can read it on a device, but I, I read at a computer all day, every day. I don't want to read my book on a computer. What, what do you like to read the most? Oh, generally, it's leadership. Is it? It's, okay. it's business. Leadership or it's, more business acumen? It, well-rounded. It okay. doesn't matter. Yeah. Time management, project management, servant leadership. Um, you know, way back into Stephen Covey's, you know, Seven Hi Habits of Highly Effective People. Um, well done. I mean, if you just go through the list of books, I, 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 I've read a lot of them. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it obviously started as a kid, so you know how this show starts. We always start with, what is your Mayberry? Sure. Um, and you tell me your Mayberry was set in Nebraska, which is interesting right. because you said, hey, look, you had some options. You bumped around to a few other small towns growing up, yep. but you're like, look, junior high and high school is where you went to Sutton High. So tell me a little bit about why Sutton is your Mayberry. So growing up in Predominantly, as a as a young child, my my father and had had moved us from small towns like Mead and Fremont and Hastings, and and in seventh grade, I, I went to Sutton to to middle school there. Um, that's where he was living, and so our our family moved there. Um, I lived there from seventh through eleventh grade, and then my dad had another opportunity to move, so he started another business somewhere out of town, and I stayed. So really, that kind of solidified my my living in Sutton and calling that my hometown. So as a senior, I lived on my own. I had some family there that owned a, an apartment building, and so I had my own apartment as a senior in high school. 
So uh, now you know that would be serious trouble for me. I well, got to hear there, about this from your was, perspective. How disciplined were you? I was not disciplined, <laughs> uh, but I, you know we played sports you know, yeah. in a small town. You play every sport: so baseball, football, basketball, track. You know, and then you just do that cycle again. So if I wasn't in school, I was working. If I wasn't working, it was in sports. And uh, and there was there was a family social network there that at least kept some eyes on me for for my senior year, but. As a senior, you know, it was, it was sports and school and, and work. So, sure. And we got to talk about sports because you played sure. with the great Spearmans. For yep. those that don't know, they went on tremendous high school athletes. Yep. And you guys had some incredible successes, football and basketball. Yep. What did that give you? When you look back on that, the values and, uh, you know, all of the things you learned as an athlete, because you got coached by some great people as well. Oh, yeah. So starting with, with Spearman's dad, uh, Chuck, I started playing basketball officially in seventh grade, joined the team. They're, they they were a team that traveled. Um, Chuck brought in every kid who wanted to play basketball and taught him the fundamentals. Um, and then if he progressed, he was just going to keep teaching you to the next level. And so that, that really helped playing YMCA ball, traveling to Grand Island and, and Fremont and Lincoln and Sioux Falls. I would say just being competitive. Um, I'm four out of five boys. And if you didn't stand your ground, you weren't going to win very much. So I've got a little bit of a competitive streak in me. Um, tenacious might be a term that, that I've heard before. I don't like to lose. Yeah. And, and we didn't lose very much. When, when I was in high school, we won, we won a lot of football and basketball uh, games. We were, we were pretty good. We got beat a few times, um, but we won a lot. Did you learn more from, especially since you were so good? In my teams, we lost all the time, so there wasn't much to to learn from. But did you learn more from those losses in high school than the victories? Or oh no, losses sucked. <laughs> I love it. We, you know, what we learned from losing was we did not like it. Nobody, I mean, our team, we were aggravated, and and we could see the clear indicators. You know, sometimes of when we got beat, whether we were lackadaisical or we just didn't hit shots, or you know, was our defense not that that good that day? I mean, you have you have good days and you have bad days. Um, we didn't have many bad days, and when we got beat, that that team usually was an exceptional team, and and it hats off to them. But man, we hated to lose, so we we just came back with more tenacity. I always find it interesting too when you play on successful high school teams, yep. how you can still pull so many of the lessons you learned there. Give me something that sticks with you today that you learned that you use in your business or in your personal life that you learned playing sports back in high oh, school. Oh man, it, it you know. Steve Spomberg was our coach for, for basketball, assistant coach for football, but just a, I think I'd call him like a, a sports minded, coach minded guru. In, in sports, you put your best person at each of their best positions, and then you have to work together to, to accentuate the positive. And by far and away, when I look at building a team in business, that's what you do. Mm -hmm. Everybody has different skills, different gifts. Um, I am not a high detail person. And so I have to surround myself with high detailed people or, or stuff falls off in the fringes. And that's, that's kind of what I look at in our, in our teams. You know, we had a center, we had a shooting guard, we had guards, we had, you know, forwards. And when we had everybody working and performing well in each of those, those positions, then we were successful. It, if you had to adjust or adapt because somebody got hurt or somebody wasn't playing well or you got in foul trouble, you've seen the performance of the team decline. Because it's pretty hard for somebody to step up for an extended period of time and play a role that's not exactly their strength. Mm -hmm. So that's what I do every day. You know, there's other lessons as well. You grew up, as we mentioned, in Sun, the town of 1,500 people roughly. Yep. yep. Um, I want to know what a day was like in a summertime. Let's say as a 12 or 13 or 14 year old, what was it like living in Sutton, Nebraska on a summer day? Yeah. On a summer day at that age, I was very lucky that two of my classmates were about two blocks away from my house and we had a city block of dirt in between oh, us. That is trouble oh, right there. And we, we each had a younger brother that were all in the same grade. So whether we're playing football, basketball, dirt bikes, mini bikes, what fireworks, whatever in that city block, you know, we had, it was like our, our Mecca there. And then their backyards abutted to just a grass field. So we were outside. I mean, from the time we woke up till after the streetlights were on, we, we played sports, we horsed around, we rode our bikes all over town, um, went to the pool, you know, walking, riding bikes, whatever we could do to get there. 
Um, but we were outside all day. Yeah. No devices then. I was going to say. <laughs> no, no devices. You had to, right? Devices I mean, were bicycles and then mini bikes. <laughs> so that was our devices. And, my, and baseballs and footballs. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. The best way to grow up. And, and, and here's the other thing. I've interviewed multiple business owners, business leaders on this show. Almost all of them have come from small towns. And and I always think back to that. I have one that I've interviewed that, that grew up in Lincoln, but still had a few years in, in a smaller community. What is it about small towns? What is it that it gives people that they end up going on to, many of them, to be great business leaders, great business owners? One, I, it, you can play sports, or you're going to be in the band, or you're going to be in the choir. I can tell you, in, a, in our small town, we were C1 at the time. So we were a smaller community when, when, when I grew up. Um, you were going to be involved in in the school. It was really, really hard to not to not do something. Um, so I think that was part of it. And then you're a farming community, so everybody is working. You know, when you talked about being 12, I mean, I I mean, we were Rogan Beans, and then at 14, detasseling, which is the worst job in the entire world. <laughs> Did it two years is horrible. Thankfully, I got a real job, um, but people work too. You know, and, and there were there were jobs for kids. Um, there's jobs on the farm. There was jobs, you know, helping farmers. Um, I built center irrigation pivots from the time I was about 16 until probably my second year in college. Um, so outside in the dirt and in the beans and in the corn and, and, uh, fixing, servicing, repairing and building them. Mm -hmm. And so people worked a lot though. Me, and that was just part of your culture. You wake up in the morning, the co-op's already running at 7 a.m. You know, there's farmers driving tractors down the road at 6 a.m. Um, just because it's dark, you know, we, we fix pivots by headlight, you know, sometimes you had to do it because when it's July and you're not irrigating, you know, crops that on land, that's more suitable for dry land, you, you got to fix the stuff. So you just learn that, 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 that drive to get something done, man. And what a great roadmap for you as your career goes on. And we'll get to that in a second. When you get to manufacturing, first off, you said earlier, you you don't have you're not great at what did you say process or oh no process process I look good write them out you know solidify them validate them do them again make make them better so what was the word you uh, used? detail details but yet you said as a kid not only did you read the paper yeah. but you had an order front page oh yeah then sports then sports yeah then right into the business section yeah. and then you wrapped up with the comics got to have the comics so you got walk me through that probably I mean, what was going through i, I love that you had that it, kind of a so a bit of that is a, is having a routine yeah you know i i know uh, back up just a little one time i was tested and uh from talent plus and then the the team that was looking to hire me and recruit me which they did ultimately was like hey you know you're really low detailed and, and that's not typical in, in a cpa or accounting because they tend to be recognized, uh, you know, in this manner. And I'm like, well, you know, as a CPA, it, it's a process, it's a methodology. Plus, the, you know, the debits have to equal the credits, right? And if it doesn't, you have to figure it out, which again, I'm tenacious, so I'm going to go figure it out. So that that was never hard or difficult because you did follow a methodology. Um, and so for me, I know that I'm most efficient when I have a process to follow. Uh, give me a, a, a playbook, give me the guide, I'm going to follow it. I'm going to tend to revise it. I'm going to make it better. Um, but once I get into that routine, I'm, I'm going to nail it. So, so being that sometimes I had to read three newspapers and I didn't always get a lot of time in the library, I had to be quick and I had to get what I wanted, right? Front page news was what's just going on in the world. Yeah. Sports was, I mean, there's always something about the Huskers in there or, or local, local sports. Um, business was just always interesting to me, and then comics were just for fun. Yeah, I, I think it's great too, and and I love that you started with front page. See, I was, I was a sports guy right out of that the gate, but clearly, it was paving the way to be a CPA because that is to me structure. It is detail, and and so you go into the world of numbers. You become a CPA. What was it? I mean, you had when did the 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 switch flip for you to say? This is my passion. This is my calling to work with numbers and be a CPA. So my my first uh, degree choice was international business. Um, I actually started at the University of Nebraska Lincoln in international business. I was taking French. Why did that appeal to you? Well, if you're going to work in business, let's do it in Paris. Right? I mean, that, that was my <laughs> yes. dad as a kid from Sutton. Yeah, right. And uh, French and I did not get along very well. Um, and, and so when I really sat down and looked at what I was going to do, I knew I wanted to get into business and I knew that 
there is a pathway as a CPA. So they're business advisors. It's not just one business, it's many businesses. And I need, to, I need a lot of stuff going on, right? I'm not, I'm not really content to do that same thing over and over and over. So, so there are some things I'm not very good at, like don't make me do it twice, right? That, that's horrible. Um, but being in business, I, I did tax returns, I did financial planning, I did audits and reviews, and, and I got to see a lot of businesses, some that were really, really small, you know, owner operator and maybe their wife or their kids work there, um, up into some really, really good businesses, even in Sioux City, you know, Wilson Trailer Company, Diamond Vogel Paints. Mm -hmm. We had some amazing, you know, accounts that I got to work on and see. That's how business works. That That's how they do things. Um, and so that was foundational for me. It was just the desire to, to, to see as much business as I could before I got into business. You know, I always think there's something right in our childhood. That's part of the reason why I like to start with Mayberry, right? Where you grew up, because I think there is something that, 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 you know, triggers you that, that makes you say, this is why I want to do what I want to do when I'm 25, when I'm 45. What was it growing up that said business is, is your passion? Or did it, um, did it come later? No, I, I had an opportunity. So the, the small business that I worked for building center irrigation pivots, I, I could have been a business owner while I went to college. Um, I ran my own rodi, roguing cruise. So once I did roguing for a while, I'm like, you know what I really need to do? I really need to go get kids to rogue for me. So I had, I had a couple of junior high and high school kids that rogued for me for a couple of years. Um, it was always just being involved at a different level. Um, not just the working level, but the strategy of figuring out how to how to quote a job, you know, call up a farmer, get your name out there, you know, find the field, give a quote or a bid on it, get the team to go do it, and then go make money at it. Yeah. You know, and, and money was not like really the key focus on it, but it was the result. You know, if I could get paid, you know, twenty bucks an hour and it only cost me fifteen bucks an hour to rogue a field. I made five bucks. Uh, I made five bucks an acre, I guess, not an hour, but acre. And without really doing that much work, right? Because I just had to make the contact and make sure the job got done. But Scott, you know, this is not normal. I mean, well, most, most well, people I, are that's just not, happy to get that job at Dairy Queen. You're not the only person to tell me <laughs> that. So I, I just, you know, just reading about it and just wanting to do something different. And, and I grew up, I mean, my dad, my dad had went through Vietnam. He worked for the National Security Administration. And when he got out, he started his own TV sales and service shop. So that was in the late 60s, early 70s, which, you know, televisions were expensive. And if they broke, you fixed them. And, and eventually that, that business wasn't a very good long-term business because mm -hmm. things became replaceable. And so you, you kind of got bought out by big box stores. But all growing up, my, my dad sold and serviced, uh, worked on his own for most of his career, and then near, near the end of his career, went and worked for some big box stores just doing you know repair work and things like that. But I don't know if that was a, a big bit of the bug, but, but it sure showed me like a different path. Yeah. Yeah, you were able to sit there, watch, learn yeah. as he's running his businesses. Yeah. Um, I imagine part of the whole mentoring process for you going into business is just seeing that, correct? Or was there more? Uh, no, we were we were pretty close to his. I mean, he had a, a couple of pretty big shops, and there were always TVs in there for sale. There was always TVs in for repair. Um, there were always customers coming through. I mean, we we spent, you know, a, as as each of the boys got older, uh, the next youngest kid helped move TVs, right? Because you know, today you can carry a TV by yourself about anywhere. 25, 30 years ago, you needed sometimes four people. Yes, they team. were monsters. So, so I, I certainly worked uh, even, even as a young boy, young man, uh, hauling TVs around. But were you also thinking, hey, Dad, here's a way that we could make more on that part that you replace? Was that happening at that point, or was no, it more? It was just, I would know. Yeah. I, I was more just helping. It, it, it was. You know, I, there's not a clear indication for me, like, when did I get wanting mm -hmm. into business? I just knew at probably way more in high school as I developed and, you know, did things for future business leaders of America, participated in a entrepreneurial contest. I did the stock market challenge every year. There was just, everything was more leaning towards business and finance and accounting and, yeah. Yeah, kind of grew, it kind yep. of built on each other. So, the, yep. so you get into... The world of, of, of being a CPA, yep. you start out, as you mentioned, in Sioux City. Yep. 
And from there, you go to uh, KPMG, uh, a large, large firm. Yep. The difference between small and large and what you pulled away from that as well. Oh, man. Um, regional accounting firms, the numbers are much smaller. Uh, big four, uh, you know, global firm, KPMG out of Lincoln, Nebraska. Mm-hmm. There's there's lots of extra zeros at the end of every, every number. Um, I worked for a number of big organizations. Nelnet was one, you know, that's a student loan finance company and loan servicer and, and really blossomed, you know, built up in Nebraska in the early 2000s into a much bigger company today. But I, I would say it's the opportunities to really, really understand business. Um, as a senior manager at KPMG, one year I, I got to read the purchase price accounting, which is a methodology employee. After a business buys another business, you have to figure out what did you actually buy for assets and liabilities, and it's it's an it's a writing you know it's like a journal there you have to you have to validate your numbers you have to prove everything out, um, and so I read nineteen one year nineteen purchase price accountings which was all acquisition mode and that was a blast I mean that was just fun just to be able to see the 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 sense that somebody put into the value of another organization and then value those assets and liabilities and then bring them into the the new company with a goal to, to make them all better, right? So nobody's buying companies expecting them to do worse. People buy companies and expect them to do better. And, and that, that was just a, that was fun. And it, it was pretty extensive in, in my tenure at KPMG. And did that then give you really the impetus to say, you know what, and now it's time to go and start acquiring. Now it's time to leave and, and get into businesses because yeah. as we're gonna talk about later, it's not just a couple of companies you've been involved in. You you own or a part owner of several. So was that the impetus that gave you the confidence to say, now I know? Yeah. When when I determined I was going to exit KPMG, I wasn't going to go down a partner route. Um, I You know, the a, a primary role for somebody in my position would have been a CFO at another much larger organization. Um, and what I felt was like that was too far away from business. It, it wasn't, you, you know, you didn't get to touch all the the products and the processes and the people. Um, you spend a lot of time doing historical reporting, which history is fine to learn from, but it's horrible for me to report on. Um, even though, you know, at a CFO at the right organization, you're going to bring value by looking out as well. But I went smaller. I went to a much smaller organization. I went from a company that had about 125,000 people globally to a small owner-operated company in Greenwood, Nebraska, <laughs> right near Iceland, uh, with about 40 people. But great products and great customers and, and a great opportunity to, to do something different than just financial accounting and reporting. Yeah. You know, and by the way, when it sold, KZ Valve, which is where you went in Greenwood, Nebraska, more than 40 people. Way more. And an incredible success story. You end up selling it to a public company. Yeah. I know it's so hard to just zero in, but how did you do it? How did you zero in? Let's take from when you start. Yep. What are some opportunities that you're looking at saying, here's how we are going to grow and here's how strategically we're going to execute? So first, they had a really good product. Second, they had uh, great customers. Some were global. Um, and then third, they had the right people who could design the right product you know, to meet a customer's demand. But boy, were they, they were, they were underemployed. Um, they were struggling to make progress on, on sometimes consistencies in manufacturing and, and had a great engineering design team, but were really limited on resources and people. And so really I just came in and, and everywhere there was a bottleneck, I just hired people. So while we're hiring people, we continue to solve customers problems. And so that kind of goes hand in hand, right? Hire a person, solve a problem. Guess what? There's going to be another problem or an opportunity. Hire another person. I spent most of my time in in developing, one, strategies and processes to make sure that what we did for our big customers were repeatable. So that required some documentation. We became ISO certified, um, which is just really, you know, tell, tell your customers what you're going to do and then do it. Um, increased our level of support and account management for our key accounts, um, and then just hired really smart, hardworking people, and then get the heck out of their way, right? Kind of show them a vision, make sure they know kind of what we're looking to do, 
Um, but if you hire the right person, you don't need that much time and attention on them. And so my job really, man, I spend time hiring people. Yeah. And we hired really, really good people. Here's what, and we're, and we're going to get to that as well, because you say that's one of the secrets um, to your success. But you read a book by Phil Knight years ago. Yep. And this, to me, runs a bit counter. Uh, and I apologize to every CPA out there. <laughs> but I think sure. of numbers, guys, right? Yep. You clearly are more than that. You love people. Yep. You love the strategy. You love the competition. But Phil Knight's philosophy was he wanted to surround himself with CPAs, numbers people, CPAs and all of that. Dominantly. And here's where I see that being incredibly helpful. Obviously, numbers, uh, knowing where the business is, yep. knowing... Of course, there's tremendous accountability in numbers as well. But this is where you have to help me. What I don't see with CPAs necessarily is that people component that clearly you've embraced and sometimes that creative marketing component. So why was he right? Because clearly you can't argue with the success or, uh, you know, he's been successful, Phil Knight. So why was he right on that strategy? I think he looked at that business um, so much opportunity and he had a vision that they were going to be a really big company. And he knew he had to buy low and sell high, right, at, at really high volumes. And so pennies matter, dollars matter, you know, things like that matter. And what he wanted to be able to do was project out and have confidence that the person who was giving him the information knew what they were talking about. So predominantly CPAs that, that are in the right firm and the right organization, they're just exposed to so much more business than than hiring a business manager who's worked at three companies, right? That, that person that's worked at three companies, there's only so much knowledge that they can gain from three companies. But for me, I mean, I worked at, as a CPA at, in a regional firm. You know, I probably did 250 different tax returns in, in, a, in a tax season. Um, I audited a number of different organizations, and I got to see all their business processes and what made them tick and what made them successful. And then at, at KPMG, man, I got, I got exposed to international work. I was in Toronto for a job and, and did some uh, uh, IFRS, which is, uh, you know, international financial reporting, you know, standards and, and, and seeing how it's different than the U.S. But you're just exposed to so much more information and business entities as a CPA that that's really, really hard to replicate for any one person at any one company. Your importance on you know, people being paramount in an organization. Uh, you're also extremely, one of the things I've known about you over the years, you're very creative. You, you come up with ways, you think about ways. How can we grow? How can we do things a little bit differently? Again, that goes outside a little bit of that CPA, yep. you know, reputation. Yep. Where did that come from? That ability to connect, that ability to be creative. Where did that come from? Look backwards, what's worked and what hasn't, and then modify your position statement to get better the next time. I, I, I like to look at, at things that we're doing really, really well, and then you, you feed it, right? You, you make it better, you, you provide assets, you provide resources. And I don't know where necessarily that came from, but I'm not a super content person either. You know, I, I, I remind people that no matter where you are in your career or servicing a customer or whatever you're doing, you're never actually done. So don't dwell too much time on the history unless there is something you need to learn from it. Mm -hmm. But just keep thinking about making progress and being better. And that's and that's kind of where I'm at in, in my life and in my career. I've just never really been content that it's like, wow, we made it, we're done, let's, let, let's just go on autopilot for a bit. I mean, you realize autopilot works for a really long time, but yeah. eventually you run into a mountain, right? So somebody, at some point, you got to get it off autopilot and you got to take control and you got to think about doing something different. Yeah. And and Eric Sherman, who I interviewed a ways back, he's an engineer and he said that he owns um, a specialized engineering firm that, that works in healthcare. He said, I don't think like many engineers and that's what made him different. And he's, that also has helped him with that people component. Do you think like most CPAs? No. Okay. Uh, no. As a matter of fact, I finally got to the point a couple of years ago where I quit doing my own taxes. It, it's <laughs> that had to be it's hard. Too, it's too complicated. It's not as much fun. I, I kind of enjoy doing it, um, but no. Today, I'll just tell you, I hire CPAs to do work for me because I'm not going to do that work anymore. Yeah. So uh, I, I do. I for sure think differently. But a lot of that has to just do with with the challenge of running a business. 
and having fun doing it. You know, I, I'm engaged and excited every day when I walk into the office. Um, I'm there early. I'm sadly generally there late a lot of times. And that's not just because it's the workload, but it's because it's fun. It's a hobby for me. I'm, I'm, I'm vested in it and uh, I like what I do. So it's not really out of, I, I guess where I'm maybe out of that ordinary is, is I don't need to just work on today's numbers or yesterday's numbers and find that as part of my career path and, and, and the work that I do. I really like being a change agent and, and setting people up for success and seeing what they can do with the right tools and the right opportunity. Oh, I love that. Um, that right there, folks, we need to bottle that because every owner needs to hear that. Now, you end up, uh, Casey Valve just blows up and uh, it was doing very well, but it takes it to new heights and you sell it. Is that a sad day or a happy day? It was a brutal six months. <laughs> so, <laughs> so at the conclusion, uh, it was a ha- it was a happy day. One because there there was the the realization that that organization was going to have a great owner and and a great supporter of the brand, and, and there was some validation that that the the work and the effort you know was fruitful. Yeah, um, it, it was a successful conclusion. Um, you know, the family that owned that business, you know, they started it with great products and, 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 and great customers. And then they supported me every step of the way, you know, even when we sometimes hired people, you know, when the ag market was down, we, we were a little bit of in the ag market. And what we knew was ag goes up and ags go and ag goes down, but you know what you need? You still need people. So we didn't care if the ag market was down and sales were down a little bit and we needed an engineer or somebody in production, we hired. We never quit hiring. I mean, that, that was just a, a consistent, methodical growth phase of always hiring, you know, new people, key people, um, and experienced people. And is that just to deal with where you're going, or do you find that by hiring, it may bring in innovation from new folks, or is it just simply, we gotta keep up with demand? And the demand is uh, no. Sometimes, it, sometimes it's demand. But I think where we where we're at, and, and my business methodology was when we had a bottleneck, go find somebody to, that that enjoys solving that bottleneck. Because when that bottleneck, whether that was a, a production run or how to serve a customer, you know, because some customers need like daily communication, and some are like, don't talk to me for for a quarter or, or half a year. Um, we we just filled gaps. I mean, we just went out there and. And, you know, I kind of put this in one of my, my position statement was I can see super clear in our business two years out. Yeah. I mean, I, I can project out extremely well. One, because I can see our funnel. Two, I can see our opportunity. And three, I can see our capacity. Then I'm pretty good in that three to five years, right? I, I can still see that I've got customer acquisition or product line development or products being released. And then I, I spend less time on that five to 10 years. You have to do that sometimes. You have to think about, well, how big could we get or what should we do or, or what if we did something? Um, but I, I, I spend the time hiring people to solve problems today, but also, you know, my expectation is we're going to grow. Mm-hmm. And you, you don't get to grow if you don't change your team. I mean, that's really, really hard to go take on a new customer or a new product line and all you really got is the same people you had yesterday. Because hopefully what you did yesterday is yielding results. Mm-hmm. You're starting to get the fruit of your labors. Well, if you take the people that are that are harvesting that fruit today, you say, hey, now we need you to come over here and do this. Suddenly they're, they're juggling a few too many things. They're not as effective as they could be. And, and man, what I want is people that are highly effective and highly efficient. Yeah. And, and part of my job is to make sure the business doesn't get in the way of that. Well, you guys sold KZ Val very well, and you talk about the business not getting in the way. Obviously, we've talked about the growth. And after you sell it, you go right back into manufacturing as a partner and president. Well, or, or no, was it a little I, break? I was, I was doing both. So, so, so well, so uh, Lincoln was, Tool of Design, you yeah, were already involved yeah, in. Okay. Yeah. We, we bought that, a uh, family and I, in January of 2020. So you can imagine you know, what March of 2020 brings, which is suddenly your customers closing down plants. That's right. COVID, and, of course. And we have a philosophy that, that we will never lay people off. We, we, we own employees. Um, we have to provide them a job and, and a career. Don't stop. Right. 
So we had to go figure out how to, because at that point I was overseeing four different organizations that I was directly involved with and then a number of small businesses on the outside. And, and we, had, we fought our way through uh, COVID just fine. We, we were fine. We were, we were aggressive. We didn't really slow down or pause. And thankfully, due to the markets we were in, we, we stayed successfully at or above. Mm-hmm. So I was running really those two organizations as part of my full-time job. Mainly because I had I had developed a management team and a structure that Casey Valve could continue to to develop, and LTD could continue to to develop as well. So when Casey Valve sold, I became president then officially of Casey Valve for a stint, part of a transition plan. Uh, today I consult with them still a bit uh, while I run Lincoln Tool and Design. Hey, we're taking a little break in the show to make sure you know about Farmers and Merchants Bank of Ashland. Not many banks have been around for 139 years, but Farmers and Merchants Bank of Ashland has. And why? Because they offer full-service business banking, and you'll always speak to a live human being when you give them a call at Farmers and Merchants Bank of Ashland. They're commercial lenders. They are more than happy to share their expertise and to help you navigate any business financing that you may need, including SBA, TIF, or Nedco Financing. So go to fmnb.com. Right below me, you're going to see that website or give them a call at 402-944-3316. Member FDIC and Equal Housing Lender. Yeah. So, but here's what I think is so interesting. You said, you know, we were going back and forth on email. We've chatted over the years. You love to make things. Manufacturing is your sweet spot because you love to create and make and you really of course leverage that in your career so talk sure. about the importance of that to you manufacturing is just awesome right i mean just being able to put parts together and then once you put them together you know you can you can buy things differently you can hire people to do different processes you can streamline the organization you can go to your customer and, and challenge them on how they're using your product and seeing if they can make it differently um, but the biggest thing is, is, is our customer base are, are global OEMs. So we work for, for organizations that make products that go around the world. And that's exciting. You know, we get to walk in their door. They, they, get, they walk in our door whenever they want to. Um, I, I don't know. I, when I, the, the manufacturing bug for me was just seeing product being made and produced and then, and then do it again, you know. At the same time, you got to think about, you know, developing new products, making things better, solving problems. Um, but I like making things. I, I like I like making things for our customers. Um, do, do you it at home? Because your wife's here today, so I'm going to ask her. Sure. Do, you, do you fix things and and tinker with things at we, home, or is it only a no, work? no? When we were first married, we were extensive home improvement folks, and and almost flippers. So I mean, we, we lived and remodeled a house for 13 months. And, and there was a point where it's like, Hey, we probably shouldn't do that again. Uh, our first house, we ripped out the kitchen sink and the bathroom at the same time and realized that the only water we had was in the shower in the basement. So we, we, we learned a few things along the way, but I, I've, I've moved on from, from that. I, I don't do many home improvement projects. I still do some, I, I still have all the tools just in case, but no, I uh, my hobbies today include business. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> well done. Let's talk about some of those things. Obviously, a lot of folks who watch this show are folks that own businesses. They are business leaders. Yeah. You talk about getting out of the way of your people. You mentioned it a few times here, and of course, when we talked before the show, what does that look like in real life? Because I imagine that's advice you'd give to any business owner. Is For sure, give them direction, get out of the way. But what does that look like in 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 real time and 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 you know on a daily basis at Lincoln Tool and Design? Sure. So it's kind of funny because I think I made a statement where I said I you know today I run Lincoln Tool and Design, but that's you know I'm stuffed in a closet, you know hi- hiding behind the scenes and and really what I work on is strategy and vision and and even today recruitment. I'm still out there being a one piece of the, of a primary recruiter as we're looking to fill some enormous gaps we have in our organization. Um, but I've got a team that is extremely experienced, committed to the company, committed to our employees, and then committed to our customers. So, so really, they're the ones running the customer. They have the daily interactions with our customers. 
They they hire vendors to make parts for us because sometimes we have to hire vendors. Even though we make parts, there's still things that we have to hire out to get made for us. Um, so when I say that, you're, my job as a leader is to set your team up for success. They should have way more successes every day, every week, every month than any business owner. Mm-hmm. You know, because at the end of the day, you don't have anything if you don't have people. They are the ones who are driving products to conclusion, projects to conclusion, serving a customer at an above and beyond rate, um, yet still having a good job, right? I mean, at the end of the day, that that's everybody wants a good job, mm-hmm. a good career, a good place to work for. And uh, that that's my job. How do I make Lincoln Tool and Design to be a great place to work where people are fulfilled in their in their daily walk, where people are excited to come to work, where they're willing to help out, you know, their teammate or their customer, or at times even our vendors, um, you know, it, it, as just part of their day, you mm-hmm. know, and that's, that's exciting to be able to do that. Part of what I get to do is work with businesses as a business coach. And the one thing I see, Scott, from probably 80% of, of, of businesses is they still struggle to get out of working in the business and doing what you're doing, working on the business. Yeah. What direction? I mean, we know how important it is. So what can you tell those folks that are, that are listening to this today saying, I need to do that. I need to work on vision. I need to get out of the, in the business. So, on. so I've actually had the chance to consult with a couple of other small businesses, some that we were looking to acquire and some that just weren't in our in our market space, but we built relationships. And what I find is, is a number of business owners, um, because they've built that business up over time, they're pretty good. I mean, I, I had a business owner that, that does the server management, right? Maintains their email. And I'm like, you know, you can hire that out. It's like, yeah, but I'm good at it and I like it. Yeah. And it's like, okay, well, you know, what's your return on investment? You know, if you just took that time where you're, you're completely enthralled and, and your email's down for four hours versus, you know, six minutes, you know, what is, what's your opportunity to go out and, and build the business? Either get a customer, hire the right person, but free that time up that says, hey, you know what? There are a lot of people in this world that are skilled at that, that I could, I, I could give them a great job. And then suddenly, right, you, you free up, maybe it's only five or 7% of your time, but as a business owner, your time's valuable and it's expensive. And all of your people, they kind of rely on you to, to make sure that they still have a job tomorrow. So when I, sp- when I talk with other business owners, whether it's in, in an advisory role or an acquisition role or just friendly business topics, man, hire the people to do the work that your business needs and you should see some growth. And, and I have validated evidence that that works, right? I, I, I don't have any organization that I've ever talked to or consulted where they said, you know what, I got rid of a couple different hats and I'm making less money or I'm selling less or, or I'm working more hours. You know, in general, the results have been, you know, I'm, I'm working a few less hours. We, we gained a couple of extra customers and I'm more than paying for those hires that I, those new hires that I have. And people are happier because I'm not the ultimate bottleneck on every decision, whether it's repairing a forklift resetting a server, you know, proofing the marketing ad that that's about to go out or an email, man, let your people do that and, and hire people that are really, really good. Mm-hmm. At it. So, yeah. and get out of their way. I mean, I am going to tell you that. Yeah. And that's, that's challenging for an owner operator who started having to do every job to really think about letting somebody else be responsible for their business. Yeah. But man, we're all terminal somebody's going to take over that business at some point. You just as well do it while you're alive and, and kicking and screaming. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, I love it. Well, delegation, boy, such a huge part uh, to every owner, and they'll see that growth take off. I know you'd agree with that. But let's talk about your leadership style. You call yourself a servant leader. Yeah. We hear that a lot. But again, what does that look like on a, on a typical day at LTD? When you are serving your people, what does that so, look like? One, paying enough attention to know what your people need because sometimes they don't see it or know how to ask for it. Um, whether that's an asset, um, I, I mean, I, I, I pay attention. Uh, we, we had a, a, a guy that was programming a, a CNC machine and, and he was hitting a button 
and then he had to wait for like 30 seconds. And I'm, I, I walked by him like, hey, what's going on? He's like, oh man, this computer's like seven years old and it's just processing data. And I'm like, okay. So we went and bought a computer that day, right? <laughs> we, you don't wait, you don't waste time. You can't right. have your people wasting time. Um, and, and they shouldn't always have to ask, but you also got to encourage your team to ask. So servant leadership for me is walking in the door, being available, not answering every question with yes or no. I try to never say yes or no, or I approve. I try to say, I'm going to support you in that endeavor, whether it's a capital asset, whether it's a new and new employee, um, whether it's, it's a need they need for their department. If they have the business case and the business plan, my job is to tell them that I support it. And if they don't have all the facts and data, right, then I give them the tools to make sure that they can answer their own question better. But my job is to support my team, help, help them do their job better every day. So if you can't, because that's the thing, I think sometimes people hear that term servant leadership and they say, well, that just means rubber stamping and saying, yes, 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 when they believe that they have a problem. But you know, being a servant leader, obviously, as you just said to me, might mean that you have to say no. So how do you work through that and still really embody being a servant leader? Well, sometimes you ask enough questions where the no becomes very relevant and obvious to the situation, um, which takes time and it takes communication and you have to have a little bit of patience because it's it's easy to say no. But if somebody just presented something and, and they did a little bit of work for it and the answer is no, well, they, they're not going to learn anything. My response is, you need to do a little bit more homework. Here's a couple of things you should look at. Now come back and tell me what you think. Rarely, rarely have I ever had to say no. If, if it's a no one, they're probably telling from my body language that it's probably not a no. Yeah. So they might talk themselves into that, but no, I, you got to give them the tools. And even if it's a yes or a no, they should know what you expect. And that takes time and energy and effort. But man, once you get that flywheel rolling, then again, you, you get to get out of the way. You're going to get better data. Your team's going to be better prepared. They're going to have already answered all the questions that I would normally answer because, you know, the first thing I'm going to do is probably ask about eight questions. Sure. And the next time it might be four and the next time it might be two. And then finally they nail it with no questions. And then it's either supporting or not supporting. You know, and, and I think what's so interesting about that, that process that you have is that they understand the why, right? It, it, they may go in saying, I really need this. You walk them through, you ask open-ended question. Maybe you have them even work through a worksheet. And at the end they say, and maybe, maybe I don't. And it gets them to the why. And then the buy-in becomes greater. Is that what you <laughs> see? Absolutely. Uh, if, if, I made all the decisions or our GM made all the decisions, then guess who makes all the decisions? <laughs> all of the decisions, right? Whether, hey, you know, there's a toilet plugged or, or man, the air conditioner doesn't work or, hey, how do we serve this customer? If you make all the decisions, you're going to make all the decisions. And then a lot of your team is going to sit there waiting for you to make all the decisions. That's bad for business. Yep. It's bad for a career. You can't grow. Right. If, if you're the bottleneck because you make all the decisions, you're it, right? You, you can't grow past your capacity. And most people in their tenure as they grow and develop and then age want to work a little bit less. But man, there's a lot of business owners working six days a week and nights and early mornings mm -hmm. because they haven't empowered their team to come out and take responsibility for something. They're still the bottleneck. Yeah. I just read an article the other day about that, about, yes, it stifles innovation and, sure. and, and it stifles really just good critical thinking yeah. within the company as well. Um, look, you have been parts of great teams. Going back to those Sutton teams that, that played for championships, yeah. KZ Valve, where you're at now. Um, but you also have your hand in other businesses as well, restaurants and, and some other things. I call you Midas. Because everything you touch, it seems like gets better or turns to gold. Or, or yeah, not everything works <laughs> awesome, but 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 a lot, but a lot does. Yeah, uh, we you know we did some commercial real estate, some residential real estate. Um, we moved out of residential real estate when the market became so hot that average homes were selling for unaverage you know numbers, and we just determined that was a good time to exit. Um, we did start a restaurant down in the Haymarket when, you know, Pinnacle Bank Arena was being built. We had a group of, of people that just said, let's do something different. So, yeah. 
you know, we started Rodizio Grill, you know, which is down Which is great. Eighth and P. Yep. Yeah. If you love Brazilian oh, yeah. uh, style, right? Because it, it's food. It, it's a steakhouse. Uh, it, it's a great it's a great spot to go before events and, and celebrations. And listen, here's I, I just got to put this plug in. Yep. You also put together a great wine list. I'm sorry. The older I get, I'm a wine guy. But you got a great wine list down there as well. We, uh, the ownership group of that business all enjoy good wine. <laughs> And, Good, uh, uh, Eric uh, Underwood, one of our partners and GM, understands that you know serve serve the uh, serve the partners well, and and maybe we're we're going to get some extra business from others. So you bet we we do well on that. Um, but yeah, I, I'd serial entrepreneur. I, I've got yeah. some other small business interest in in other local local businesses where there there's a GM or even a president, and I tend to provide advice and guidance as more of a COO. Uh, operating officer, so I understand, you know, HR, uh, insurance. You know, I'm the tax matters person mm-hmm. for all these businesses, and and I, I tend to just enjoy that aspect of, you know, concluding on the year, you know, making your your strategy, you know, that supports, you know, the future based upon that. Dealing with the CPAs who who do all the tax work for us, um, I just enjoy that. I mean, it's just it's just a good part of a of a year end. But as a CPA, mind you, my year end used to be four and five months long. Now I try to have my year end done by the 21st day of January. So my first three weeks of the year are not very awesome because we just plow through stuff. Oh, I bet. But, but the goal is to get it done early. Yeah. So the, the advice you would give, there's a lot of business owners out there that say, look, I've got my arms around business one. Yep. Maybe I'm a part owner in business two. For that person that wants to get into some real estate and they want to broaden that portfolio, they want to be a part owner in a restaurant, they want to do some things outside of their core business. What do you tell them that they have to know or they have to, because you've obviously assembled an incredible team to make this all work, yep. but yep. what advice would you give them? Don't do it. <laughs> um, it you know, it, I, I love being involved in business. So, so it's a hobby um, we have a home office. Uh, my wife does some accounting for us. Uh, we have files and, and paperwork there, but it's because I, I love doing it and, yeah. and I really, really enjoy it. So that's what I kind of do sometimes in my free time. Um, but if I were to, if, if somebody said, hey, I want to get involved in multiple things, one, you should clearly define what you're good at. What value do you bring to those organizations? So for me, Everybody needs insurance. Everybody needs employees. Everybody needs tax and accounting. So I have a skill set that is generally very repeatable across all platforms. Mm-hmm. Um, if 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 somebody was really good at construction, for example, it might not be the best thing for them to go into a restaurant unless they need to build a restaurant and then they're going to build another one. So you know, you, you find out what you're really good at. Make sure you 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 not only think you're good at it, but people around you tell you that you're good at it and then go see how you fit into those other businesses or or organizations. Um, I would say most people I know or even business owners are not involved in as many organizations as I am. Um, So again, I'm also not very content and I, and I like what I do. So if I can be involved, uh, I will. Uh, I, I still consult for a number of other businesses. I still consult with KZ Valve. Um, I, I can't get away from some of that stuff because it's fun. It's interesting. And when people find value in that, um, you know, go, go enjoy your time with them. Yeah. So, you know, the team broadens out though, much more so than just what you have at work. And when you have all these other companies that you're dealing with, you've got to have, and this is something I have not spent near as much time with the folks that I've interviewed. And I told you coming in here, you, you brought your wife, Kendra, in. And I had a chance to meet her at a Husker game just by chance, yep. the two of you. And what struck me about that conversation that day is, A, how supportive, B, how in tune she is to your businesses. That team has got to exist way beyond your work team, right? I mean, it's got to be at home. And the support that you have to get from your spouse, yep. the value of that and what is brought to you. So I couldn't do all of my hobbies and business ventures and and next best thing without mm-hmm. somebody, uh, first of all, taking care of our kids. So we do have uh, one recent college grad and one that's right in the middle of her college tenure. 
Um, and so Kendra took the time about six or seven years ago to say, hey, I'm going to I'm going to leave the the workforce. She was a paralegal for a law firm here in Lincoln and uh, just decided that I'm going to go take care of my family. So family first, that's my role. That's my spot. That really helped me kind of accelerate what my time could be spent on. We had already had some small businesses, but but I knew I was going to get invested in a much bigger organization, which meant a lot more risk, a lot more possible time, and, and a lot more utilization of my skills. And if she didn't go take care of the house and the home and me, because I'm kind of a needy guy, uh, I, I wouldn't be where I'm at today in, in business, uh, you know, ownership and management. Um, but I made that commitment that, hey, once the kids are gone, I mean, I will also tell you, we're, we're going to transition a little bit out of some of the small things. And when I travel, you travel. Um, she's been with me to Brazil. We had a trip about a year and a half ago to Italy and, and Belgium. She went on that business trip with me because if I'm going to travel, I'm not staying in hotels all yeah. over the world by myself. Um, we've got a trip in, in Minneapolis. I'm doing a consulting engagement up near Minneapolis. She's going with me. Uh, it does mean she has to drive, so I can work sometimes. But it's it's fair. That's fair, I think. Uh, oh, and I bet I'll that was her. hard to get her to Italy, wasn't it? Uh, yeah. It was not. Yeah. <laughs> it was a it was a great great trip. Um, I think the only the only tra- problems we had traveling is uh, one time I forgot my headset. So for about a two hour uh, drive, we had engineers talking product development and and things that that were that were not very exciting to her, while staying up too late the night before and needing coffee and a bathroom <laughs> break and I'm on a call. So I, I learned my lesson there. I, I plan better. That is a partnership right yeah. there, Scott. Yeah. You know that. Yeah. Well, to, to every to every entrepreneur out there, boy, make sure that that team at home yeah. is is yep. is on board, right? Yeah. You guys have that, which is which is fantastic. Let's talk now about this is how we wrap it up. Okay. We call it three and then we're out of here. Okay. Um these are a little random, a little crazy. First one, did you hear that Pat Sajak is retiring? Yes. Yeah. So that that hit the news. Devastating day for the 630 hour in our household. So let's go with the king of game shows. You got Pat Sajak, you got Steve Harvey, or you got Alex Trebek. Which one of those are you putting at the top? Or do you do you uh, substitute a fourth in there that you like? So... The top is Merv Griffin. Oh, there we go. Who, who actually owned and produced most of those shows, right? So, but if I went into a host, it, it it would be Jeopardy, right? Man, give me give me that useless information that just sticks in my brain forever. Um, I I like trivia. I love unusual trivia. I usually answer questions that nobody even has ever heard of or you know before. Um, I love the Jeopardy. Yeah. So Trebek, was, he was great. Yeah, there's a buddy of mine named Christy Grinvold who made the show. He's a assistant football coach at Bennington. And I said, what was he like? You know, what was Trebek like? He said, oh, it was great. He said, at one of the breaks, it was actually football season. And, you know, he loved sports, Trebek. He loved hockey. Came up to him and said, I'm so sorry that you have to miss football for this, you know. Christy's like, no, it's a, he said just tremendous person as well. Loved his sports and Alex Trebek. I'm, we, we all miss him. I know that. Yeah. All right, number two. Okay. You get to be mentored. Uh, by one of these great inventors, and I'm going to call them both inventors, and you have to choose. You can only choose one of these two. Are you getting mentored by Benjamin Franklin or by Steve Jobs? Mm. Only pick one. Yeah, for sure. So Jobs was just great at at understanding and driving you know, business products that people not only wanted, but demanded. I'd probably hang out with him for a while. I, uh, Benjamin Franklin would give me lots of, of, of all kinds of other information and, and cutting edge, right, and new. But, man, I like to make stuff. So give me Apple, right? Give me, yes. give me the ability to make a billion devices. That, that surprised me because I thought you'd go with Frank. Cause he's oh, it's that a, hands-on said, guy. He said one, and I had to pick that <laughs> one. So. Good one. All right, here we go. Last one. Now, here's the deal. You get a chance for an internship today. The key is you can't go to work. You, you, you basically have to work side by side with this guy for one year. It's, your desk is right next to him. But that means you show up there every single day. Everything else has got to be put aside. And his name is Warren Buffett. Do you take that unpaid internship for a year right now today, not when you were 25, or do you say, 
I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to pass. No, I do it. Of how, how would you not do it? I, 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 I think, was gonna say. you know, and, and there's a lot of things to learn from him that are in the books and, and really his, his method methodology isn't super complex. I don't, I, but how he makes things less complex, how he gets to the meat and potatoes of an acquisition, their investment strategy, you know, right in the waves of, 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 of business and not really worrying too much about short term because what they buy are long term assets. Um, I'd take that in an instant. That'd be a great sabbatical. Yeah. So here, here's the thing. Don't you think when you walked away from that one year internship that the thing you'd learn most is probably how simple he makes things? How, I mean, I don't know. Oh, he, he complicated mine, simplified. I mean, I, I know I know his, his annual reviews with his individual business leaders, you know, it's generally a one page document. Mm-hmm. Here's the things that you're doing well. Here's the things that, you know, you might need to improve on. Here's a little, you know, uh, what the vision of, of what your business could be. Here you go. And then we'll talk again in 12 months. Yeah. Now, granted, people can get, you know, his business leaders can get him when uh, when they need him. But, uh, yeah, he doesn't, compl- oh, it's not overly complicated. But he does that because he's also bought great companies and hired great leaders to run those companies. Well, here's the thing that I've learned about you. You've been successful because you keep things simple as well. And you put the the emphasis where it should be on people, uh, on great strategy, on culture. Um, and what a varied and fun and exciting career you've had. And uh, it's just been great getting to know you. And I've, I've loved the hour we spent today. So thanks for coming on. You bet.